Okay, so we're going to go back over some of the slides that you looked at yesterday so that I can talk you through some parts and also check your work to some of the things that you were supposed to do. So for falling objects, for anything that's near our Earth's surface, all objects will experience the same acceleration due to gravity. So if you look at the picture of the apple to the left, Notice what's happening to the apple as it's falling. If we think back to our picture diagrams, when we were doing those diagrams, you would be drawing in a dot. And if you look at what those dots would be doing, we would see that they would be getting further apart. So that would tell us that our apple is picking up speed as it's falling. So it's experiencing an acceleration that is going in the same direction as its motion. That acceleration on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. For right now, what we're going to be doing the first couple days, we'll be rounding that to 10 just to make it a little bit easier for us. So again, we see that nice constant acceleration, and we can easily see that by drawing in those dots and seeing that our, as our apple falls, we're covering more distance in the same amount of time. So in the absence of air resistance, all objects will fall with that same acceleration. Free fall is defined as an object falling with only gravity acting on it. So we are not considering air resistance acting on our object. Of course, that makes it a little bit difficult for actually doing testing because we would have to do testing in areas where there is. And a little video will come up for you to help you to understand some of those a little bit better. So again, that acceleration on Earth is close to that 9.8 meters per second squared. I want to point out to you, notice that our graphing comes right back in when we're graphing. Our position versus time when we have an acceleration is this nice curve. So showing that we have that quadratic relationship taking place. Complete this statement. What goes up must, and I think everybody could easily fill in, come down. So why? Well, the why in that, of course, is because of gravity. So what happens to our object then as it's moving up? If we know gravity is what eventually makes it come back down, what is our object doing as it's moving up? Hopefully in thinking of this question yesterday, you thought about it and realized it must be slowing down on the way up. And as we saw with the apple, on the way back down, it must be gaining speed. So exactly how was gravity discovered? Well, how gravity was actually discovered, most people think it was the apple falling from the tree and Einstein figured this out or Newton figured it out. And of course, the big one is Newton, the apple in the tree. In reality, it was actually some guy named Galileo. And what Galileo actually did was he studied inclined planes. So he was just studying a ramp and he looked at these objects as they were rolling down these ramps. And he determined that each one of these ramps had their own unique acceleration. And of course, the steeper the ramp, we know, common sense kind of tells us that our object would end up picking up more speed. So as the steeper the incline, we would get a greater acceleration. But he started to actually notice a pattern. And this is where you were supposed to yesterday start to look at that blue packet that you had gotten, that concept development page 2.1. And this is what you had. And then on the next slide, I told you at time is one second, find the velocity and find the distance. So if you didn't do that yesterday, we're going to talk through that part today. So we have an object that's starting from rest and it's gaining speed. V is equal to acceleration times time. While it's undergoing this uniform acceleration, it says it's covering a distance of one half AT squared. This uniform acceleration occurs for this ball rolling down this incline. And then it tells us later that we're picking up speed at a rate of two meters per second every second, so that our acceleration is two meters per second squared. The positions of the ball are shown for the one second intervals. 
complete the six blank spaces for the distance covered and the four for the speed. Okay, so when you were doing this, starting off here, hopefully when you looked at this, the easy part was actually the speed. So for the speed, we have velocity is equal to our acceleration, which is two meters per second squared, times our time. So this particular time, this is when we're at one second, time is two seconds, time is three seconds, time is four seconds, five seconds. So the only thing we're actually plugging in here then is the time. So two times the time of one second would give us this velocity of two meters per second, which is what we see here. Two times a time of two seconds is gonna give us a velocity of four meters per second. Two times a time of three seconds, six meters per second. Two times our four is going to give us eight meters per second. And then two times five gives us 10 meters per second. So we notice that increase by two meters per second every second, that's our acceleration rate, so that our velocity, we notice that nice pattern of it increasing by two meters per second each second. Now we look at that distance equation. So for that distance, tells us that we have distance is equal to one half. Acceleration is two again, times time. Well, one half times two, we know that's just going to give us one. So we can rewrite this equation then to be just our time squared. Again, our twos cancel here. So if we're doing this as our time squared then, Notice two seconds. Well, two squared would be four. That's where we're getting this long line of four here. Now this whole line here is four. If we'd already gone one meter at the one second mark, and this whole line is four, four minus one, the distance between one second and two seconds is three meters. But the total distance I've traveled, my displacement, is four meters. Now I'm going to do the same thing again, but I'm going to plug in three seconds here. Well, three squared is going to give me nine. So nine meters is the total distance I've traveled at my three second mark. Now, just looking at between my two and my three, I take my nine minus four, and this gives me five meters here. Okay after four seconds. So I'd plug in four squared. Four squared gives me 16. So then when I look, I take my 16, that total distance to here, to here is nine. So 16 minus nine, that gives me seven. The last one is done for us, but if we would plug in five seconds, five squared gives me 25. Okay, so this full length, to here is 25, and we know to here was 16. So if we subtract those two, we're gonna get nine here. So what exactly does that mean? Well, that comes into the questions in A and B. Do you see that the total distance from the starting point increases as the square of time? And yes, we definitely saw that because our equation was just time squared by the time we were done. This was discovered by Galileo. If the incline were to continue, predict what our distance from the starting point would be for the next three seconds. So the next three seconds at six seconds, well, six squared is gonna give us 36 meters. Seven seconds, seven squared, so that's gonna give us 49 meters, and then at eight seconds, 64 meters. 
Note the increase in distance between the ball positions with time. Do we see an odd integer pattern? This is that odd integer pattern they're talking about. One, three, five, seven, nine. So yes, that is noticed. If the incline were to continue, predict what would be those distances the next three seconds. So for the next set, since we're increasing by two each time, it would be 11, 13, and then 15. So this is what Galileo was looking at and what he was finding. He was noticing that there was a definite, definite pattern that was taking place. He noticed that the ball was had a nice steady acceleration. He figured out what that acceleration was. And then he applied that to, well, what if an object, instead of being on a ramp, was actually falling straight down? And that's what we're really studying the most in this chapter, is objects that are falling down or are being thrown up. So to determine how fast, this isn't a new equation for us. It's the first of those three kinematic equations that we had looked at in the first part of this chapter. To find that instantaneous speed, or instantaneous velocity, we would take V final is equal to V initial plus the acceleration times time. Note that this is the instantaneous, this is not the average velocity. And what does that mean for us? It takes one full second for our object to actually gain that much speed. So if we go back to that ramp, our ball started off with a speed of zero it took one full second for it to get up to going two meters per second. So between one and the one second mark and the zero mark, it was always less than two meters per second. So right at my actual one second mark, that's when I'm finally up to this instantaneous speed of two. So we're gonna apply that to something that I think you can deal with pretty well. And that is, looking at it in terms of money. So we're looking at what's happening if Aunt Minnie gives you $10 per second for four seconds. How much money would you have? And this is also in your packet. So you can follow along and we can fill in the answers as we go. So thinking about this, hopefully you would see that after four seconds, you would have $40. A ball is dropped from rest and picks up speed at a rate of 10 meters per second. After it falls for four seconds, how fast would it be going? Okay, so we know that the rate that we're picking up is 10 meters per second, and that's really squared. That's what 10 meters per second per second is for four seconds. So that's 40 meters per second you have $20. So now we actually have something to start with. And Uncle Harry gives you $10 each second for three seconds. How much money do we end up with after three seconds? So when we look at this, we know $10 for three seconds. So Uncle Harry is giving us $30 and we had 20 to start with. So we end up with $50. Now the same thing can happen then when we're looking at what's happening with final velocity. Now here's the key to this one. A ball is thrown straight down with an initial velocity of 20 meters per second. After three seconds, how fast is it going? Okay, so our initial speed is 20, but it's going downward. So we have to make that a negative 20 meters per second. Plus, our acceleration due to gravity. Our acceleration due to gravity, which way does that act? Well, it's acting with the motion of the object, so it's acting downward, so it's negative for three seconds. So negative 10 times three gives me a negative 30. I add that to my negative 20, and I get negative 50 meters per second. If you have to pay, um, you have $50 and you have to pay Aunt Minnie $10 a second, how long till you run out of money? Well, if you're handing her 10, that's going to be five, five seconds. 
If you shoot an arrow straight up at 50 meters per second, when will it run out of speed? Okay, so it runs out of speed. Going back to this equation, running out of speed means my final velocity equals zero. My initial, I thought it, I shot it straight up at 50. So my initial is a positive 50 plus negative 10 meters per second squared for my acceleration due to gravity times time, because that's what I'm looking for here. When I rearrange this, I'm going to bring my 50 to the other side. So I'd have negative 50 is equal to negative 10. Sorry, I'm not sure why that line keeps coming in every once in a while. Times 10. So then you would end up with negative 50 divided by negative 10 is equal to your time. So your time ends up being five seconds, just like we would have guessed from the money part. Notice that my time also cannot be negative. So if you end up with a negative time, go back and check your signs. So what will be the arrow speed five seconds after you shoot it? Well, we just figured out that it took five seconds for it to run out of speed. So at five seconds, if it's out of speed, its speed would be zero. Now it wants us to find what would the speed be six seconds after we shoot it, seven seconds. So again, we're going to plug into that equation for V final. Our V initial is 50. That's what we originally shot it up with plus negative 10. Times six seconds. So our negative 10 times six gives us negative 60. We add that to the 50. So negative 60 plus 50 gives us a negative 10. Now the reason for this is that negative would indicate that it's on its way back down. Well, that would make sense if it ran out of speed, that's at its highest point. So when our object is moving up, when it reaches its highest point, it runs out of speed and then it falls back down. So now on its way back down, we're now negative in our velocity because we're moving downward and it's 10 meters per second. Now, if we do the same exact thing for seven seconds, I'll give you a second to do that. You're just replacing the six with a seven. And what do you get there? So hopefully you got negative 20 meters per second for your answer there. Sometimes we don't want to figure out though how fast. Sometimes we also want to figure out how far our object has fallen. So that's the distance an object has traveled while it was in free fall. And note, we're not going to be using our average velocity here to do this. So this is going to be, if you remember, I told you there were three main kinematic equations. This is that second equation that we did not see in the first part of the chapter. So to find how far, we're going to look at the change in y. And instead of using x here, I used y because we're moving up and down. So the change in y equals the initial velocity in the y times time plus one half the acceleration due to gravity times time squared. Remember, change in y would mean our final position minus our initial position. For many of our problems, we're going to actually be starting from rest. So if we start from rest, zero times a time, any time, doesn't matter the time, would be zero. So it simplifies our equation then to just be change in y is equal to one half acceleration due to gravity times time squared. Now again, that's only if we are starting from rest. For this concept development page, again, we're going to be using negative 10 meters per second squared just to make our math a little bit easier as we're getting comfortable using these free fall problems. Okay, so in your concept development page, you have a page that looks like this. So 
we have this lovely speedometer here. Up at the very top when time is zero, we have not fallen at all and our speed is zero. So what this tells us is that our initial velocity of our rock is zero. You can also read that in the description in the little paragraph off to the side on your page. Now the second one, they're getting this for a reason. Now technically I should really be plugging in a negative 10 here. I just did not put the negative in when I was trying to type this a little bit ago. So when you're actually reading on a speedometer, speedometer is called that because it's only reading your speed. So that's just the magnitude of our velocity, which means even though we will get a negative velocity, we only have to report out the number. So if I look at this first one at one second, I have plugged in one second to my time times a negative 10 and I get 10 meters per second. So I see my arrow then that I'm pointing to the 10 here. We got the five by taking since I started from rest, I don't need this term. That's just zero. So one half times negative 10 times time squared. Okay, well one half times negative 10, I can simplify this for myself and say, well, I know that's gonna be five meters per second squared times whatever my time squared is. So my time squared in this case, one squared would just be one times a negative five. So it has fallen for five meters. If it helps for you to put a little negative out in front of there, you can, but it's just telling me it fell five meters. All right, for two seconds. At the two second mark, I'm gonna plug in a two for my time. Two times a negative 10, that's gonna give me 20. So I come over here and I make my line going straight to the 20. Now I also have to figure out how far I've fallen. So to figure out how far I've fallen, I'm gonna take negative five times my two squared. Well, two squared will give me four. Four times a negative five, I'm gonna get 20 meters there. Same thing for the three seconds. So the next thing I just plug in three. 3 times a negative 10. So I'm going to be pointing to my 30. If I look, my next part, 3 squared, that's going to give me 9. 9 times 5, that's going to give me my 45 here. Now, I'm going to continue on to one of the other pages in the blue packet. But I do want you to continue with number with times of four second, five second, and six second, and to answer the questions over on the left of your page. The other part that you're going to be looking at then is free fall distance. So for the free fall distance here, what I want you looking at is how would we set this up? So number one, speed is one thing, distance is another. Where? Will the arrow be, well, if I shoot it up at 50 meters per second, when it runs out of speed? So again, I'm looking at that equation, change in y equals vy initial times time. That's one half. I'm just gonna plug in my negative 10 here for gravity times time squared. So it tells me that I shoot it up at Five, or 50 meters per second, and it runs out of speed. Well, I know from the first part, it runs out of speed in five seconds. So I can plug in 50 meters per second times five, plus my one half times my negative 10, it's gonna give me a negative five, times my five squared. So now we would need to multiply that, add them together, and figure out where exactly is our arrow. I want you to follow this same principle, and I want you to finish number two, 
Number three, notice in number three, she drops the penny into the wishing well. So her initial velocity here is zero. The average speed during the three seconds. For you to figure that out, once you have figured out how fast it was going in part A, we know it started with a velocity of zero. It ends with the velocity that we get in part A. So add those two up and divide by two. That would be your average speed. How far down on the wa water surface? So that is looking at our change in y equation. Notice in number four, she throws the penny straight down. So in this case, your initial velocity will be a negative 10 meters per second. And again, you're gonna plug into the equation. So in a minute, I want you finishing this page as well. But before we do that, I wanna look at more practice on this back page with the charts. So here's what's happening here, and I tried to color code this for you. Notice in this first box, it's giving us our initial velocity. And I also tell you over here what the initial velocities are. Those do not change. Your initial velocity is your initial velocity. So you will be plugging that in every single time. So 30 meters per second for our first chart plus a negative 10 times whatever time you're plugging in here. So for this last one, it's going to be 30 meters per second plus a negative 10 times 8. Well, negative 10 times 8, that's going to give me 80. Then I take my 80 and I have to add to that 30. When I do that, I get negative 50 there. You're going to do the same thing for those distances. Again, for this whole first chart, for chart number one, your initial velocity will be 30. For chart number two, you're going to find out all of its velocities, all of their distances, using an initial velocity of 40. And for chart three, we're all going to use the same initial velocity of 25. So you now have time that you're going to be finishing those three things on the worksheets. So going back, you will be finishing those speedometers and the odometers on the rock that's falling. You'll fall, finish the how um, far on the ant mini sheet, and then you'll finish these three charts for today. If you get done, then there would be time for you to work on your algebra packet.